Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 56 of ADHD for Smartass Women, and it is gold star time. You know, you and I thrive on encouragement, appreciation, praise. It really helps our ADHD brains to stay motivated. So I am going to start with a wonderful review from Diane P. Young from Canada, which is captioned, Nonlinear thinking and drifting off topic. For the longest time, I dreaded public speaking, answering questions posed by teachers and schools, and even engaging in an intellectual conversation. I wanted to do these things, but I feared going off on many tangents as ideas and thoughts whirled chaotically in my head. It made me feel inarticulate, semicolon, even dumb. Thank you, Tracy, for explaining how nonlinear thinking can result in going off topic, podcast number 38. Everything you said resonated with me, and I'm truly grateful for your insight and recommendations. So that review was from Diane in Canada, and I want to thank you so much for your kind words, Diane. Your appreciative and encouraging comments, they truly motivate me to keep going, and so I wanted to acknowledge you for them as well. I also wanted to say that I appreciate your use of the semicolon between it made me feel articulate and even dumb. It reminds me how a semicolon is supposed to be used because for some reason, simple grammar and punctuation lately, it just literally eludes me. I just forget, you know, what were the rules? How am I supposed to write this? Is that how you use that word? So I have been trying to use the semicolon more and more because I know if I don't use it, I will lose it. One more thing about reviews. You know, December and January, they're historically bad review months in podcast land, and my podcast is no exception. You know, every single day, I get your kind emails and social media messages and audio clips and even your texts about the podcast, and I make a point of saying thank you, right? But I always forget to ask for reviews on my Apple podcast uh, channel. So here's my mass request. If you have posted or sent me a kind acknowledgement of how the podcast has changed your life, would you please, please, please post a review if you haven't already done so? You know, reviews with words, so written reviews, they would be wonderful. But, you know, I'll take the gold stars if that's all you've got for me. So, okay. So what do I have for you today? Or maybe I should say, who do I have for you today? So today I have invited Linda Karanzalis to our podcast. Linda, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. <laughs> Linda, Linda K, we'll call her. She is a board certified cognitive specialist and parent student coach who provides executive function training and social emotional learning programs to people of all ages. Linda also just wrote an article for Attitude Magazine's Winter 2020 issue, and it's all about ADHD and nonverbal learning disorder. So welcome, Linda. How are you? Welcome. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited. Yeah, I am so delighted to have you join us today. So Linda, I want to start out by asking you about your ADHD journey, because 
you have ADHD, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So can you tell me what, um, what were your symptoms when you were a child? Well, when I was a child, I did not like to go to school. I became school phobic. I just didn't feel comfortable in school. I couldn't, you know, I also have a learning, a nonverbal learning disorder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything was really hard. I had to work so hard and I knew I was different um, than everybody else. I just didn't know why, you know, I couldn't remember things. I couldn't focus. I was always staring out the window. I was more the inattentive type of ADHD, spacey and daydreamy. Uh, so it really wasn't picked up. I slipped through the cracks. So you wrote, I just love what you wrote actually um, in the article that you did for Attitude Magazine. You asked a bunch of questions. You said, as time went by, I realized that not all of my struggles were caused by ADHD. Why was I so naive, gullible and awkward, bumping into things and people? Why couldn't I read maps or get jokes? Why did I have trouble riding a bike? unlocking doors, and walking in a straight line. Most mm -hmm. troubling of all, why wasn't I able to understand the meaning behind other people's words? People became annoyed with me as I asked the same questions over and over in different ways, attempting to decipher what they meant. So mm -hmm. on one hand, you were, you were diagnosed with ADHD as a child. Is that true? No, no, because when I was a child, you know, but they really didn't know about it. I mean, it goes back as far as like fidgety Phil, if you've heard of him, but yes. it really wasn't mainstream or well-known. I really didn't learn about it until the nineties when I began teaching mm -hmm. and I had a professor that taught and her son was in my class and she really educated me. And I said, the light bulb went on. I have ADHD. So the thing, you were smart, right? Did, you did well in school? Did you have good grades or? Uh, no. When I was a kid, I really struggled to learn. I hated school. Mm. Uh, and I was really surprised that I became a teacher. I was a late bloomer. I didn't start college till I was 22. Um, and I struggled in the beginning because I didn't know how to study. I didn't know how to organize myself. I, I just, they pushed me through school. And I was even told I wasn't college material and I have a master's degree, you know, and that really annoys me because nobody ever has the right to say that to anybody. Um, so, you know, that was, you know, a big struggle for me. And then I got to college and, you know, I just was so passionate about this because determined that nobody's going to suffer like I did. And I became a special ed teacher. I graduated with honors and then I started teaching. And that's when, um, I realized I had ADHD and that I was just like the kids. Yeah. So Linda, um, so when you were a child and people would tell you these things, teachers would tell you you're not college material. Did you believe them mm -hmm. or in your gut, did you know, wait a minute, I am smart. There's something else going no, on No, I believe them. Oh. I totally believe them because I got a lot of negative feedback. I didn't get encouragement. Um, no. But I, at that point, I believe them. But your parents, but as I got older, your parents were mm -hmm. really encouraging, right? I, I remember that. My parents, my father really was because he struggled in school. Mm. Um, but they really didn't know how to help me. I mean, because they're 90 and 98 today. And they didn't really, nobody really knew about this. And so they really, you know, didn't know how to help me. Got it. So you were finally diagnosed then with ADHD. Was it in the 90s? Oh, it was some time after that. I, I, I really don't remember. Uh, but I finally was diagnosed. Yes. I don't re actually remember the year. Okay. And I, I find it's... But I was an adult. I, I was in my 20s. You know, I was in my late 20s. Okay. So I find it so interesting because I talk about purpose all the time and the best purposes give meaning to our past. And so it sounded like you did that exact same thing. You struggled so much in school and you didn't want another child to struggle the way that you did. So you were going to get out there and make a difference in that way. Oh, yeah. That's my drive and my perseverance. And a lot of people with ADHD have that. Absolutely. You know, put the blinders on, hyper-focus, and that's exactly what I did. And I was determined. So you were then diagnosed with ADHD. So where did the nonverbal learning disorder come from as far as why did you even consider that? How did, how were you ultimately then diagnosed with NVLD? Well, that was, you know, that was hard because virtually it's very little known about today. Mm -hmm. And so I kept looking, you know, because I persevere and I kept looking. I, I knew that I was struggling 
Um, and I can tell you some of the things I struggle with. And I knew that this was different from what anybody else that I knew struggled with. I mean, and it was, it was kind of traumatic. I mean, you know, the suicide rate for nonverbal learning disorder is high. Wow. And that's based on the old research. We don't really have that. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think with a lot of the interventions and the more awareness that, um, I don't think, and this is just, I don't have anything to prove it, but you know, that it's, it's much better. Um, if you get, you know, if you get, so help. tell me, so, what was it that was happening in your life that you started thinking that, okay, there's something else. What is it? And how did you discover that it was NVLD? Well, I, you know, people would get mad at me. I'd ask a ton of questions and they'd be like, we just told you that. And they would think that, you know, I just didn't care or that I wasn't that smart. Um, and it has nothing to do with that because, you know, you have average to above average mm -hmm. intelligence um, with NVLD. So a lot of things, I was easily led. I was gullible when I would walk to, next to people. I got a lot of negative feedback. I would bump into them because when I walk next to somebody, I have to walk on the left because I walk to the right and I, and I, I walk slanted and I bump into them. Um, and I would just have trouble, you know, very uncoordinated riding a bike. Um, things would be in front of my face and I wouldn't even be able to find them and they'd be right like visual discrimination. There's a lot of visual spatial difficulties. Uh, uncoordination. Uh, couldn't drive anywhere. When the navigator came out, it saved my life because you know how I would get to places? I would drive. I would stop at a gas station. I would ask. I'd go a little bit more and I kept doing that until I got there. And that's the only way I could get anywhere or I knew how to get from my house say to the mall, but I didn't know how to get to the mall to somewhere else. And was that true? Even if you had gone to the mall 50 times in a week, you still couldn't figure it out? I knew how to get there. But if I wanted to go there and not home, uh, it was always a struggle. I would remember, but then I'd make a wrong turn. Um, and then I'd get lost, you know, or I'd miss it because I couldn't judge the distance. That was another thing. So I'd like miss the turn. Um, yeah, it didn't matter, you know, and, and so people were always like, you know, I would get the strange responses from people and I just couldn't really connect with them or people would make me feel bad. Like some, you know, like I still struggle mm -hmm. with this, uh, but not as bad as I used to because, you know, I've learned how to deal with it. Uh, somebody came to visit at a friend's and I, they wanted to go to the post office and I didn't know where the mailbox was. And they said, you don't know where the mailbox is in your own town. Very sarcastic, mm -hmm. you know, or. I was driving and I, I have a horrible time with my windshield wipers, like because of my fine motor skills and remembering like where they are, you know, fast, slow. And I couldn't turn them off. I and somebody said, the person said to me, oh, you don't even have to turn your own windshield wipers off, you know? I, so the reactions of people and the annoyance, um, things like that being taken advantage of, you know, not thinking people are nice. They look nice. They act nice. So if they're asking me to do something that's not right, sometimes, I mean, I knew right from wrong, but I couldn't tell when I was being taken advantage of when they were acquaintance, when they were a friend, like everybody was my friend. And so can you explain to um, our listeners and me as well, what exactly is nonverbal learning disorder? Well, it overlaps a lot with ADHD. And, um, we really don't know everything about it. We know that people's brains have different spleniums in the brain where the people that do have NVLD and people that don't, um, and that they're not processing nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication is 80 approximately, depending on your research source, uh, communication. Now, that changes the meaning of what is said. Only 20% is what people say. So you're relying on the 20%. Your brain is not picking up between the right and left hemisphere. There's like these fibers. And this is kind of what we know now. And you're not picking up on all the nonverbal, the, the tone of voice, the sarcasm. You don't know if someone's making fun of you or not, or if they're sincere. I, uh, the eyes, you know, how are their eyes moving? Um, facial expressions, body language. You know, these are all things I had to learn. Um, so that is a big part of it is, you know, you're not getting 80%. Can you imagine? 
the difficulties. It's like navigating yourself in a foreign land. You And you're very literal. So you're holding people to what they say. So you can become, they may think you're argumentative. And I see a lot of kids diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and nothing could be further from the truth. But they're relying and they're going to sit, they're going to argue with you. Like, that's not what you said. You said this. You said that. And they're going by exactly what the words are. And, you know, all the things I just mentioned, the nonverbal completely changed. So, Linda, in a brain scan, so, can you see this going on? Well, you know, I, there's not much known about it. The NVLD project is funding research with Columbia University to do more of this research and find out there's not that much research. So, they do know about the spleniums, the, the, that that mm-hmm. part of the brain. Um, so, you know, the, a lot of this research is being updated because the old research is from Rourke. And and you asked me how I found out about it, and that's how I found out from my own research. And I and Sue Thompson, who is is no longer here, she passed away. She did a lot of writing about it, and I read this, and I said, "My God, this is me." And I stumbled. Well, I didn't stumble upon it when I was doing my research. And um, that's how I found out. So, you know, and there's these visual spatial difficulties. People with NVLD talk a lot. Um, sometimes they don't, they can't get out what they want to say. Usually they're very, very well spoken, though. Um, but sometimes um, they can't, when they're talking, they can't like discern. They're into the details. They don't get the big picture also of what people are saying. And sometimes when they talk, they might give too many Well, that's details. so interesting because it's actually different um, in some respects than ADHD. I mean, if you're saying, you know, they don't get the big picture versus I think people with ADHD, they're more about the big picture than, you know, the small details. They're able to put all those small details together. And when I think about, well, I think about myself and I certainly think about my son, probably what we're gifted in is the social intelligence part, you know, getting all those nuances. Um, so I, I find that really interesting, actually. Well, yeah, well, a lot of ADHD people, though, you know, everybody's mm-hmm. an individual. And a lot of them have social skills problems because they yes. blurt, they're impulsive. And they are doing it because they're blurting <laughs> right. and impulsive. When NVLDs blurt and are impu- it blurt, they're just being literal and there's no tact, you know, so being right. blunt. When ADHD does it, it's because, you know, they're impulsive or, you know, they have a combination of both things. It depends on the type of ADHD they have. If they, you know, you learn social skills by observation. So when you're younger, if you don't observe what's going around you because you're not focused, you're not picking up the social skills. So, but then there are people with ADHD that are socially gifted and charismatic. So, you know, it kind of really varies per person, but ADHD is more about the brain chemicals. Uh, a lack of them being released for focus. And that's not what NVLD is about at all. But you at all. Yeah. And you can be misdiagnosed. So many are misdiagnosed with ADHD and they're NVLD or they're both because uh, and then they're put on medication and medication doesn't work. Well, I can just imagine what a nightmare this would also be if you have both, because with the ADHD, you're distracted, you're not paying attention. With the NVLD, on top of that, when you're distracted, um, when you're not distracted and you are paying attention, you're not understanding social cues or the meaning behind people's words, so you're still not understanding what's going on. <laughs> and, and it's a very tough yeah. road. And because it's invisible, people think they attribute, you know, oppositional, um, want, want mm, your own character. way, uh, you know, you know, character defects and, um, you know, that's just not it at all, but it is, it's a double whammy because you're, you know, and it causes a lot, of, even with ADHD, but even more so like depression and anxiety. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I help, how many kids and adults I have that, you know, haven't been able to connect, haven't been able to be successful and hold down jobs because of this and connect with others and being rejected. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's devastating. So ADHD um, is recognized in the DSM. Why is Mm -hmm. NVLD Mm -hmm. not yet? I, I mean, I know personally, I have heard the term used over and over. In fact, with my son, initially when we weren't sure what it was, the woman who recommended that we get him tested, she threw out NVLD. Um, so I, my, my gut tells me that a lot of, um, teachers do know about it and a lot of therapists know about it. Why is it not in the DSM? 
No, that is a myth, okay. myth right there. Okay. Teachers don't know about it. We're just starting to hear NVLD. Um, it's not the fancy diagnosis, the well-known dose of like ADHD diagnosis. I mean, I felt like a lot of times like um, it's the pioneer in a cover wagon forging new territory. You know, teachers will get upset with kids when they question over and over because they think they're being oppositional or when they do things and they don't recognize the boundaries or they're not picking up on things and they think they're being a class clown. Um, also, therapists, I can't tell you how many I went to. And they just didn't believe me because I didn't know I had MVLD. I was so well-spoken. I was teaching. But was I really thriving? I was thriving as a teacher. I got awards. Um, I did great things, but it took a lot out of me. And it was very hard to communicate with the other mm -hmm. teachers as well. The politics, which there was a <laughs> lot of. Um, so, yeah, and I, I was at a great disadvantage. And so the... um I started doing things with kids that were non-traditional that I knew would help them. So that caused a lot of flack as well. And, um, you know, therapists, I get very upset and angry because they're using these techniques that don't work. They're not trained in neurodiversity. And, you know, you look good. You know, it's invisible to the naked eye. You're very well-spoken. You have a college degree. You mm -hmm. have a job. But yet, being so depressed, that doesn't mean that you're not depressed or anxious. And not everybody achieves to that level with NBLD. Um, if you don't have that strong drive like I do, you know, I think that comes from my ADHD. You know, many people just don't have it. And they have this learned helplessness ah. where you just keep failing and failing and failing. And even if you don't have NBLD with learning disabilities and ADHD, if it's severe, you know, and you're not successful. So it's like, when I get people come to me and parents, find, you know, find me, the kids are like, I've been through everything. Nobody can help me. It's a learned helplessness. And so going to therapy really actually did more damage to me because I was not validated. And I was, and as I started finding out about it, I was educating the therapist about it. I was educating them about ADHD because they didn't know about it. And I'm an educator and I had to like train them in NVLD. So it wasn't really doing me any good. So you really have to find somebody who understands which is a challenge, even though we're hearing about more of it today. A lot of um, people that do the diagnosing don't believe in NVLD. They're like, well, it's not a diagnosis. Some of them do diagnose it. There's a lot of controversy. Okay. So the reason it's not in the DSM-5, it sounds like it's because there's not been enough research on it. And there's, there's still right. kind and of the jury's out in terms of, well, do we believe in this or do we not? Right. Okay. It's right. interesting because I, right. I personally, but you know, then I think about the woman who recommended, you know, who looked at my son and said, well, maybe it's this. She's so brilliant. And so she's so far ahead of her time. It kind of makes sense that she would know about right. it. Right. Even people that say that, oh, they will tell you that they specialize in it and they don't know or they're recommending. I'm, I'm talking about diagnosticians and they're still recommending things that don't work because they're going by tradition. You see, nobody really knows what mm. the treatment is. Parents call me and they're like, we don't know what to do. Nobody's heard of this. What do we do? And they're recommending things that really some of the, some of the things that help for ADHD and learning disabilities do help, you know, but some of the things that they recommend don't. And these are so-called experts. And I don't mean to bash people, but I could, but being one with NVLD, I've run up against this a well, lot. Well, I have a theory that I don't care what you have go to an expert who also has it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because then yeah. they have firsthand yeah. experience of what it feels like and what it means day to day. Right. So what percent right. of kids have NVLD? Do you have any idea on that number? Well, we really don't know because, you know, they're getting misdiagnosed or they have both, but about, you know, 10% of the population has, you know, learning disabilities. Okay. So out of that, we, you know, we're, we're not really mm -hmm. that sure. And do you have any sense of what percentage of kids are misdiagnosed with ADHD and really have NVLD? I mean, do you see that a lot? I really, I do see it a lot. I see it a lot, but I don't, you know, I, I mm -hmm. see it all the time. And then I see them that they have both. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I see it a lot. I'm able to pull it out, but 
So I really don't know because I don't know, you know, what other people are doing. They, I just had somebody call me and say, well, you know, um, I think my kid has NVLD. They went and got diagnosed and they wouldn't give them the NVLD, uh, you know, label. And another professional had mentioned it. And she said, well, why aren't you diagnosing this? And you told me that you have in the past. She goes, well, in the past, I worked for somebody and I did evaluations uh, as a neuropsych and they did believe in it. So I needed to do what they wanted me to do to write it in there. However, it's not in the DSM. So I'm not going to do mm. that. What do you look for when you've got, let's say you have a child in front of you. What do you look for when you're trying to determine, is it ADHD exclusively, or is it ADHD and NVLD, or is it just NVLD? Uh, well, you know, the big clue is the visual spatial. Did, you know, did they learn to ride a bike on time, tie their shoes? Um, can they, uh, they can usually participate in sports that aren't team sports, like running or something like that. Um, it's different for everybody. See, that's the thing. This is not a cookie cutter diagnosis. And that's what's throwing people because, you know, one of the neuropsychs that I work with says not everybody fits this a, the same way. But I look for those motor difficulties and, you know, ask a lot of questions about that. Um, one of the big signs is being so literal and not being able to, you know, are you saying to your kid, I know if you're finding yourself thinking, geez, I know that's what I said, but that's not really what I meant. Like if you say crocodile tears, you know, that your kid could say, well, what does it, what does that have to do with a crocodile? How do you know a crocodile <laughs> cries? You, you know, um, or I was just reading somewhere in a book when I talked about this in one of my YouTube videos and I don't remember the book, but, uh, and this is where the anxiety comes in because you really don't know what's going on. You know, so you're not getting these meanings. And the, this kid became nervous because his mom would pack a bottle of water every day. And the mom couldn't figure out why he was so nervous, you know, as the weather was changing. And he's like, am I going to have water? Am I going to have water? And finally, you know, it came out that he says, well, the, the bottle says spring water. What am I going to do when it's not spring? Oh. How am I going to drink water? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's also a language piece too, right? Not understanding. That's not just, you know, uh, nonverbal. Like, yeah, you can tell when somebody talks, maybe, you know, if they're joking or not about that. And you can kind of figure out, okay, like, you know, getting jokes for me is very mm -hmm. hard. And it can be very embarrassing. So you just kind of fake it and laugh. And I, that's another thing I ask kids and adults. Um, so. Are they connecting with people? You know, and some, and here's the, here's the big thing is that they don't know themselves what the problem is. So they don't know how to correct it. You know, they'll keep making the same mistakes. Now, ADHD people do keep making the same mistakes over and over. And sometimes they don't learn from their experiences. It just takes a few more times, but so that, that's a little bit of an overlap. But, you know, there's something that's called you can be dysemic. And you can't make the connection between the behavior and its impact on other people. They know they're doing something wrong, but they don't know what. So they're making these social mistakes over and over. And they don't even understand that they're mistakes? They, no, sometimes they don't. If, you know, people don't always give you feedback. You can understand if somebody's mad at you, right? You can read that pretty clear if they're really mad. Or if they say something very blunt and literal that you get it. You know, a lot of people with NVLD like people that are blunt because they know where they stand. They need to know the rules and they stick to the rules. Almost too much to the rules that they can't, they can't be bent. It's the, they don't see so the they gray really area. So they really like structure. Right. Well, with people speaking to them. Yes. Like not, but they can't pick up on if, you know, if they're not connecting, they may not even know. Like when I was in high school, I would, you know, they can have an active fantasy life and, and pretend that they imagine what it is that they want. You know, like I would imagine, oh, my phone's ringing all the time. People are calling me. Ask when I was in high school, it wasn't happening. I had no friends. I didn't know why. I had not a clue why. But 
you know, that's very painful. And so, and then it's some, you know, it's hard to know that, and some kids don't know, they think it's normal. They don't know that mm-hmm. they don't know. Right. So, you know, so again, it varies. I obviously knew, you know, but some kids think, okay, they're not understanding that these small circles are forming the older you get, that you're just not in the same class that you know somebody, you know, or you're going to the same place or at the same location, or, you know, you say hi, you're thrown together, but they're not getting that outside of that people are meeting in other smaller Mm -hmm. circles, that it's more refined. So some are aware. And so some what's aren't. the treatment for NVLD? Well, there really is no treatment. And that's why, you know, parents are like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So what I do is, you know, is I demystify it for them. Being understood is the number one thing. And that can reduce the anxiety. Being understood, having somebody that understands you, you need a guide, you need a mentor, somebody that will show you the ropes. So especially you have to watch with kids and some adults too, that they'll be taken advantage of because they, you know, are gullible. You know, maybe I have one, uh, I worked with one where she was paying things mm-hmm. for other people. Well, I could see if you have no friends yeah. and you feel like people don't like you and then finally someone pays attention to you, you want to believe what? that that's your friend. <laughs> right. Right. And you know, And even though they want to believe it, you know, and, you know, are kind of desperate for it, they still really can't tell if they're there. They think that they're their friend, but they're not picking up on it, but they're not. They just don't know. So parents will try to explain, you know, so-and-so, this is happening, that's happening. They're just not seeing it. So you have to do a lot of talking and you have to say things that aren't obvious. And you have to explain, like, you know, you don't know what's going on the outside of someone's appearance. You just can't go by that. You don't really know what their life is like behind the scenes and who they really are and what their agenda is because they're very They trusting. are very trusting? Yeah. Yeah, very trusting of people. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're just not understanding that this person could have an agenda. I mean, they're, they're acting nice to me, you know, but, you know, people act nice all the time and don't mm-hmm. tell you how they really feel. You know, and so things like that. Can you teach um, someone with NVLD how to read faces, how to read expression? You can work on that. Yes. And you can work on that and you can teach the social rules. A lot of times social skills groups don't work. I've I've taught them. And if you have a lot of ADHD kids in there and they're bouncing off the wall, (laughs) like romper room, the kids, especially the inattentive ADHD and the NVLD, they don't want to go back because it's all about managing Mm. behavior. And some are not comfortable. So you, you know, you have to acquire these skills first before you can practice them. So parents, I train parents really how to be coaches because you could send them somewhere once a week, but that's not going to be enough. Right. So you need to teach them. I myself work on, you know, educating on, I mean, it's a big relief to people when they get, when they find out it's a major relief. It's like, and then I, t- I work on executive functioning, but not in the traditional way, because that that's another thing. Executive functioning, we're all throwing that around now. It's nothing different. We've known about it for a long time. It's been studied. But now schools are more aware of it, and they're saying that they're addressing it, and they're not. They're doing the same things they've always done. Untimed tests, sitting to the front of the I room, agree. color coding books. And... That is, that's very frustrating. And by the time I get somebody that's in college or in high school, they're just like to even follow through with those things. And then people will say to them, you kind of want to smack them in the face. Do you have a strategy for that? What's your strategy? As if that strategy is magic, you know, because when things happen, they all happen together at one time, just because you have a place for your keys doesn't Mm -hmm. mean, you you know, so I work on cognitive pro. I don't do that. I never do that. If I do that, it's the last thing that I do. Then it will be more helpful. I work on science-based programs, and that's why I left teaching. I had tenure. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I could have this great pension right now, right? (laughs) But that's not my calling. That's not what I was put here to do. So I work on science-based programs that directly change cognitive processing, auditory, visual, active working memory. I have seen wonderful results with that. And it's not studied because, like, where's well, the Can money you explain for that? more what that means? You know, 
that means that you're training. It's kind of known as brain training, which there is controversy over because like there's different kinds of brain training. There's different programs and like Lumosity doesn't really work. Like there's not a lot of research on that. You know, everybody kind of hears of that online. This is like doing a protocol of mental skill exercises. It's kind of like a video game where you have to pass a level to get to another level to get to another level. And so you're gradually, it's very hard to explain because they're like, let's say you have a So are we talking about, this is a, a program that you do with these kids on computer? Okay. Yeah. It's a pro. Well, I work with them one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. face-to-face online. I have an office, but nobody I wants know. to come. I know. Things are changing. <laughs> anymore. Right. So, um, cause everybody's so busy. And, and then I give them supplementary, um, things to do at home on the computer. They don't have to do homework. They don't, a tutor is not going to help you. You're not going to ever become independent. Tutoring was designed to be a short term process. Mm -hmm. Catch up and move on. Not a lifelong process of somebody, you know, sitting next to you to get the work done to get through school. So we're going for independence. And it does improve social skills because you need processing to get social skills. So, and then, you know, they're relieved because it's not like they have to leave and like, oh, now I have to do all this work to use what I learned. It happens automatically, like texting and typing and driving or your heart beats. You don't think about it. Your body takes over and does it. And that's what we're going for. So explain a little bit, you know, just can you give an example of what, how you work with them on yeah, this program, yeah. what it does, what they have to do? So like I will show them a bunch of arrows or, you know, I call them paint brushes. And I have little paint brushes that are in a row and they will say to me the directions of each one. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's pretty simple. And they like this because it really sure. builds self-esteem, you know, and then I will make it harder. And then I will say, when you say right, you're going to see left. When you say left, you're going to say right. Then the next level may be, I want you to look at that arrow and visualize if it was turned a quarter turn, like a clock clockwise. So if up, if you turn it clockwise, like 15 minutes, it becomes, the mm -hmm. arrow becomes right. Do you follow me? Then I start timing it and having them beat their score and do it in so many seconds. So we're working on processing speed, doing things quick and fast with accuracy, not just getting through it, you know, um, because it's uncomfortable to focus, you know. So you're working on visual processing at the same time. So you're never just using one of these cognitive pro cuz cognitive processing skills comprise that's what makes up executive functioning. So skills. you have to step back and do that's what everybody the work even before you get to executive functioning. It's like the foundational work cuz Yeah, because you need these it's like yeah. the foundation of a house if you use poor materials So it's you can crumble. teach them these visual spatial yeah. kind of, you know, tricks like how to learn even which arrow, what it means to go right. They're not, they're not strategies. They don't have uh -huh. to go and apply them. You're mm. training the mind. Like if somebody had traumatic brain injury to learn how to read and write again, when you read, you don't really think about it. You just do it. So it's like when you text, you know, you, some of these kids could text with their eyes closed. They're not thinking my finger goes here. Yes. I do this. You're driving. You're thinking about your grocery list and you're there. It's going to happen automatically. And that's what we're going for. So you don't need to do this over and over and over again. It's developing independence. And I've seen so many, I've been doing this for 25 years, so many results of life. I mean, I keep in touch. I have kids graduating college, kids that are teaching college, kids that are, one's a newscaster, and they tell me how this helped them. They'll, like, I would say, you know, at least like four times a year, I'll get notification from a parent or somebody and they'll say, this is what did it. And they so remember. what you're really doing here, Linda, is you're teaching skills. Yes. Yeah. Not band-aids. So that it, it, these things become automatic. They don't even have to think about them anymore. So then yes. they're on a level. Right. Just like driving. Right. Now, you're not going to be perfect. I can't cure yeah. anybody. And, you know, there's a lot of people that will mm -hmm. take your money out there. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. crappy programs, you know. You really have to be, I'm so passionate about what I do that, I, everything that I do with people, I've done myself and I've tried it out on me. No, I, I think this is wonderful. So if I can ask you one last question, when you look at mm -hmm. NVLD, 
Um, you look at the diagnosis. Are you hopeful? Does it seem like we are finally moving in the right direction or what? Well, you know, we have to get this in the DSM and that's what the nonverbal learning uh, project is doing because then hopefully there'll be some treatments developed. But, you know, I don't know what they're going to develop. It's probably going to be just strategies. I mean, mm -hmm. this could take years, you know, to get this understanding. Um, so it's probably just going to be a lot of what you do for people on the spectrum, ADHD, and some of that works. Probably a lot of education and understanding it and social skills. You know, hopefully therapists will be more aware and they'll be able to work. And it's because it's always standard, find a therapist. And right now, I don't have a lot of faith in that. Yeah, I can't imagine at all. talk therapy, how that would do anything. Yeah. So, and that also doesn't change your performance so that you're not as depressed so you can actually achieve. It's just talking about it and coping with your feelings. But, you know, if you achieve at a higher level, that's what's going to get you out of the hole. I do get a lot of calls that are very sad with people, you know, that, I mean, there are kids and adults that are not functioning. They're on the outer fringes of society. You know, they're living at home with their parents and they're 30 or 40. We seem to know more about being on the spectrum now, which there can be some overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be. So a lot of parents are just embracing that label to get the help that they need. They're going that route. So I'd say it's harder for the older people that, you know, that high school, college, and even, even kids today are, you know, slipping through the cracks. Well, Linda, thank you so much for talking to us about NVLD and educating us. I mean, it's just like with ADHD. The more we talk about it, the more people discover right. that, oh, this is actually a thing. Is there anything special mm -hmm. that you're working on that you want to tell us about? Right now, I am on a new TV network. It is so exciting. It's called Awake TV, and it's only been out for like nine weeks. And Deepak Chopra was just on there. And found about it. So he's given it a lot more awareness. And I have a show there and it's all live streaming. It's kind of going to be, it's going to be like on your TV, you know how you hit Netflix mm -hmm. and you can watch it. It's going to be live streaming quality programming. So, and, and there's a parenting section and there, and it, it's not going to be the mainstream. It's going to be for some people, you know, being into energy, being into different ways, being conscious of who you are, being in the present moment you know, that kind of thing. And so I get, what's exciting for me is I get to talk about that because, you know, you are who you are and your gifts and your journey. But I also add it with the educational and the medical. So that, you know, it's more of a spiritual, but not religious. So Does are you going to be talking about NVLD or what are you talking about on? Well, I just did my show yesterday and I, I talked about how, you know, when you have a journey in life and your path, I really feel that we are put here to teach mm. the world kindness and compassion and love that I feel like we have a special job, even though it's uncomfortable. And, you know, would we choose it? No. <laughs> but, you know, people need to learn to be tolerant. Yeah, we can use a lot of that right now, couldn't we? <laughs> right. And kindness and compassion. So I'll be bringing issues like that. And how to relate, but I'm not, but I'm not abandoning, you know, the medical, the educational and the way that I go about it. So it's, it's kind of like the whole perspective of the whole right. person. So that is, it's not on my website yet, but you can go to Awake TV. If you watch it live streamed, mm -hmm. it's for free. If you subscribe, like I have a discount, it's like $5 a month, but other than that, it's $10 a month. So that's what I'm working on now. That and sounds I'm excited great. about that. And I'm, you know, like working on, I've been getting on YouTube a lot. And so people can find me on there and Facebook. I'm working on, um, you know, be getting more awareness so, out there um, like that. So if people want to learn. Which I didn't really do before because I was so busy working with people, you know, but I've taken on this advocacy role now more with the nonverbal learning as an ambassador. And I'm speaking out now where I really didn't because now I'm at the age where, to put it plain, I don't care. I don't have to worry if you approve of me or not. See, and that's the thing we do is we mask of to fit in society to get opportunities. So I don't care anymore. So I've taken on the this role and that's why I'm not on social media now. I'm a huge proponent on we are not meant to fit in. We are here to stand out. And the minute we do that, we just, everything gets better. So if people want to learn more right. about you, where can they find right. you? 
they can go to my website, advantageslearningcenter.com, and it's two Ds because there are always advantages. You, th- there you have all the social media links there. And when you go to like YouTube, you know, you can subscribe, you hit that little bell button on the bottom and you get like updates of when the new videos, you know, Facebook, things like Wonderful. that. Following. And we will put that, um, I'll put that in the show notes. I'm also going to post the link to the excellent article that you wrote for Attitude Magazine about NVLD. So anyway, Linda. Where did you find that? I thought it was only in print magazine. Is, um, is it online? Gosh, I, you know what? I just assumed it was because mine was. I am certain. Well, you know what? I guess I'm going to have to find out. Is it, is it online? If it isn't, if it isn't, I'm sure we can scan it and get it up there as well because I, yeah, we yeah, can scan no, it and I get it out there. And people can always call me. You know, I always, you know, they can call me or text me. Um, that's all listed on there. And, you know, I respond. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Linda. I, so appreciate it. And to our listeners, that's what I have for you for this week. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Linda, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal, I already asked for that, didn't I? Anyway, our goal is to change <laughs> the conversation know. around ADHD, <laughs> helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they can discover their amazing strengths. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Edsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.